My girlfriend took the opportunity to cheat on me while my mother was dying with a guy who was just released from jail thinking that I would be distracted with my mother's death. When I caught them, I never let them knew that I knew. I did some research and found out that the guy that she cheated on me with had a long rap sheet with tons of previous crimes. So I decided to use all of that in my revenge plan. That's a very short summary of part one, which you can listen to via the link at the top of the description in much more detail. But this is where part two begins. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell to turn on notifications. He should have never been let out of prison, but I had my mom's funeral to focus on and had to pull myself together. By the time her funeral was over and everyone had left, I was exhausted and mentally spent. As I put my head on the pillow and tried to sleep, Angie called, not knowing my mom had passed away or that I knew what she had been up to. She'd been texting and calling much less in the days before my discovery and after. I answered the phone and tried my best to sound as glad to hear from her as I could. I didn't let on what had changed with my mom's status, nor that I knew about her and Will, or that I knew about Will. I let her do most of the talking and internalized every word I knew to be a lie as if I totally believed her and appreciated her false sympathy. When she claimed she missed me as we said goodbye, I lied and told her the same. But in all honesty, at that moment, if she'd dropped dead, I would have not cared in the least. I had a few weeks off from work with bereavement. I knew things with Angie were over over and done with. Part of me couldn't help but struggle with how cruelly she had treated me, intentionally or not. I was glad to know the truth about her and about Will before any further lies and betrayal could occur. But I felt what both of them had done to me at a time when I was struggling to keep it together was just flat out wrong. I wanted revenge. I wanted to destroy both of their lives and yet never let either of them know that I had any part of it. I called my human resources department and filled out the necessary FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, paperwork to stay out longer than my given two weeks. I truly had no reason to worry about getting fired, but I took the legal route and had enough of a nest egg to pay my bills for half a year or more if I needed to. Revenge on Will was quite easy. As he was on parole and a felon, even a minor charge would get him sent back to prison to finish his original sentence, but I didn't want him just to have to finish out his original sentence. I wanted new charges that would bring him so much time behind bars, he never saw freedom again. I'd met his parole officer on many occasions and she knew me well enough that if I had called, she would have investigated Will. Felons have difficult times gaining employment. If he had a job, I had my doubts he was gainfully employed to be able to afford a new Mustang and insurance. I parked down the street from Angie's house in a car that she wouldn't be familiar with. I saw Will's car in her driveway. I had two iPhones on my accounts, one for work and the other for personal use. I walked down to his car and stealthily duct tape my work phone securely to the underside of his back bumper. I went back to my car and used the Find My Phone app to locate my work phone where I knew it to be. At around 2 a.m. when I heard him rev his engine before pulling off from her driveway, I casually followed him, not wanting him to suspect that he was being followed. I was about a quarter mile away from the phone signal when I noticed my phone had stopped moving. I followed the signal to a cruddy looking house in a below average part of Angie's town. His car was parked and he'd already gone inside. I wrote down the license plate number and parked down the street. I slept several hours in view of his house after seeing no activity. When the sun rose, I went and bought some breakfast to eat and returned. Over the course of the day, it was very easy to tell. Either Will had a lot of friends who saw no reason to stay and talk very long, or he was dealing. He was most likely dealing a highly addictive substance, like C, H, or M. After a few hours, many customers returned for more of the substances he was obviously selling. I took photos of each car that stopped by along with some video. I went back each day at about the same time to document the continuing activity. I also observed each night at about 6 p.m. when I knew Angie was getting off of work, he would leave. I trailed him each night to see him meet Angie at a restaurant or went straight to her house. I had major doubts that she'd ever been to his house, at least not that house. I had enough evidence to turn it into the local police, but I decided to document his activities one more day as I knew he hadn't been out to get more substances to sell. That last day, I staked out his house around 3 p.m. People stopped coming by, which was unusual. I sat and observed when about 30 minutes later, a large black Cadillac Escalade pulled into his driveway. I had usually seen no more than one person get out of a vehicle and go into Will's house. This time, I observed three large males exit the vehicle and open the back door to escort a middle-aged man inside. They stayed in Will's house for over two hours 
hours, which absolutely nobody had been doing. I was fairly certain the middle-aged man was his source for the substances he was selling. I drove by taking a picture of the Escalade license tag. At home, I downloaded the photos and video I'd taken of Will's activity to my computer. I made a detailed report citing activity from the four days I'd observed of what was going on. When I finished, I printed out 30 pages of photos of people heading for Will's door to buy these substances. I saved all video of activity I'd recorded to a SIM card and placed it into a small plastic box for safekeeping. I knew it wouldn't take much to convince the police of what Will was up to. I was giving the cops actual admissible evidence with times and dates stamped on each each photo and video, but I wanted to put so much heat on him that the police would be the least of his worries. The next morning, I went by the town's police station in Angie's town. I calmly walked in requesting to speak to someone in their narcotics division. A uniformed officer came out of the office section. I shook his hand and I handed him one of my business cards. He stared at the card for several seconds as two of the lawyers in the firm I worked for regularly worked in Angie's town. The cop knew the business card carried quite a bit of clout even if I never passed the bar exam. I told him I had some information he might want to take a look at. The detective happily led me back to a conference room where we made small talk about mutual acquaintances. But soon, I pushed a folder of paperwork and the box with the SIM card across the table towards him. Listed on the first pages was Will's full name, date of birth, his criminal record, and parole officer. The detective examined the photos and I sat quietly as he did. By the expressions on his face, he obviously realized he'd been given some information that could easily lead to an arrest warrant for Will. He must have have also imagined how much narcotics those arrests could get off the streets, potential promotions, and other positives. He thanked me for the evidence and placed the folder back down on the table. He asked me if I would be willing to testify. I explained how damning the evidence was so I wouldn't have to. He smiled and casually asked if there was anything I needed. I explained that I felt Will had been allowed out of prison far too soon. It was obvious he had not been rehabilitated and deserved to go back to jail for much longer. The detective agreed but again asked, what I wanted in exchange for the information. I pulled out a photo of the black Escalade with a license plate number and pushed it towards him. I asked him to write the tag number down for his own benefit. I explained the owner of the Escalade might be an even bigger dealer. I reaffirmed that I wanted my name kept out of any police or court reports. He agreed. I then lied and said that my firm was representing someone who may have been set up by the owner of the Escalade. He knew I could have gotten one of the lawyers in my firm to call in a favor for the information, but he always knew lawyers liked to use their favors sparingly. He thought quietly for a few seconds, realizing I'd given him yet another lead to potentially follow. I'd done more detective work in five days than his entire staff had done in months, so he happily agreed. Ten minutes later, he returned with a printout of the tag with the name and address of who it was registered to. I folded the printout and put it into my pocket. The detective and I made some more small talk about sports and cars before I shook his hand and headed out to my car. I drove home knowing that a judge would soon be filling out an arrest warrant for Will. I kept to myself for a few more days monitoring the arrest reports from Angie's local paper online. One morning, the front site showed a photo of a very bewildered Will being led away in handcuffs. As long as nobody had made any stupid errors to get him off on a technicality, he'd be finishing out his original time plus many additional years. There was always the possibility that he may get a good lawyer to get the charges reduced or find some loophole to get him off scot-free. I couldn't and wouldn't allow that to happen. I drove to the location that the cop had given me. Sure enough, there was a large luxury vehicle sitting in the driveway of a modest house. Down the street, I waited about an hour until I saw what I believed to be one of his bodyguards leave in a different car. I followed and watched the guy go inside a mini mart. I parked around the other side so my vehicle was hidden. I got out of my car, lit up a smoke, and waited for the guy to come out. My sunglasses obscured my face quite a bit. When he exited the store, I called him over telling him I needed to tell him something. I'm sure he thought I was just going to ask for gas money or tell him he needed to find Jesus. When I told him I had some information his boss, who I'll call Marcus, might want to know, he was shocked. He asked who I was. I told the guy none of that was important, but I was certain with the information I could give him, Marcus would greatly appreciate it. He began looking around nervously, thinking that it might be a bust, but I told him to relax. I told him to tell Marcus that Will had gotten busted, which he knew to be true, and had every intention of cutting a plea bargain. I suggested that Marcus get one of his boys in county jail to have a talk with Will. But I also explained they all needed to lay low until the heat had died down. Of course, I had no idea if any plea bargain was on the table, but a stranger volunteering such information out of the blue sure as hell wasn't going to look good to his boss. I knew how things work well enough to know that if Will made it to prison, the average dealer 
had enough connections inside to leave Will eating out of a feeding tube the rest of his days, or worse. As I walked away, the guy asked me my name, and obviously wanted to get his piece from his car. I simply explained that Will had some payback coming from a previous betrayal, and that Marcus had picked the wrong guy to sell his product. That wasn't a lie. He'd betrayed me. Neither Will nor Angie had any inkling of my past, or how vengeful I could be, but it was enough to get the bodyguard to take my advice seriously. He quickly walked to his car as I hurried around the building. I slipped into a grocery store and watched Marcus's bodyguard drive around the parking lot several times looking diligently. When I saw him pull out of the lot and speed down the road, I calmly exited the store, got into my car, and drove towards home. I hadn't been driving 10 minutes when my phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was Angie calling. When I answered it, I tried to act surprised and happy to see her. Without even a friendly greeting, she asked how I couldn't have let her know my mother had passed away. She'd seen the obituary in my city's newspaper. I simply replied that it had seemed she was busy enjoying life and that I didn't want to be a burden to her with my grief. I quickly asked why she hadn't been calling or texting as much lately. That led to her changing the subject and asking to see me. I tried my damnness to act happy to hear from her and told her that I missed her. I asked her if she could meet me out for dinner at our favorite restaurant in town. She readily agreed. Since Will was no longer around to keep time with, she was glad to have me back to fill in the void. I showed up to dinner with a smile and a long hug, trying to control the urge to break her spine in half. I was surprised she didn't say anything when I avoided kissing her. I'm sure she just assumed that in my grief, romance wasn't something that I had in my mind much. I just had a very good idea what her mouth had been doing and I didn't want Will's salad-tossing, knob-slobbering prison germs on me. We sat at the bar and ordered two drinks from our favorite bartender. He knew us as a couple because we always tip very well. When our drinks arrived, I excused myself to the restroom and typed a short message out on my phone that read, make my drinks with no alcohol and make hers doubles. When I returned from the restroom, I sat next to Angie at the bar discussing drinks we'd enjoyed but hadn't tried in quite a while. I acted as if I was going to pull up the recipe for some unusual drink. The bartender came over and asked if we were ready for another drink. I told him we were celebrating after not seeing each other for quite a while. I held up my phone for him to read the message, asking if he knew how to make that drink. He read the message and smiled, agreeing the drink I'd requested was a specialty of his. I'm sure the bartender and Angie assumed she could get as sloshed as she wanted and that she'd be heading back to her place with me afterward. I had other plans. Angie commented on how strong hers was. I told her I could barely taste it in mine. We ordered several more drinks. Angie commented about how sloshed she felt. I acted confused, stating that I barely felt a buzz at all. After several hours, I paid for our dinner and drinks with a sizable tip. As we exited the door, I acted like I'd gotten a very important call, which I needed to take. After the obligatory, nonsense, non-existent phone call, I told her I had to rush back to my town to the office. One of the lawyers needed something for a case early the next morning. I asked her to go to her house and wait on me, promising the errand wouldn't take long. I helped her into her car and watched her pull off before using my cell phone to immediately call the police and tell them that I'd seen a drunk driver leaving that restaurant. I urged them to hurry. The person was in no shape to be driving. I jumped into my car and headed towards Angie's house about two miles away. About a mile from her house, I saw blue lights ahead of me and slowed down to see Angie's car pulled over. I knew she was going to get a DWI as that is in fact what I had planned. What neither she nor I knew was that Will had been using her car to deliver the white powder to low-level dealers under him. They did the obligatory search of Angie's car and found several ounces of the white powder stashed beneath the back seats. I had absolutely no intention of getting her arrested for narcotics possession with the intent to sell, but the fact that Angie had given me her spare car key the same night she'd given me her spare house key, I knew Will could have just as easily easily been the one to screw up my life. Neither still had any idea that I knew about their unscrupulous cheating that was revealed to all later. As I arrived back at my house and my cell phone rang from a strange number, I answered to hear Angie crying and blubbering while trying to tell me something. I got her to calm down. I actually wanted to hear what she had to say. She managed to tell me that she was in jail, to which I innocently asked where and for what. When she told me what she had been arrested for, I was genuinely shocked about the drug arrest. I asked her what she wanted me to do. She wanted me to help get her out and asked me to post bond. I explained that since my mom had died, I couldn't risk putting up any of my property due to probate issues. I could have easily put 
put my own home up as collateral, but I viewed her drug charges as collateral damage, as she damaged my life enough. The charges for possession of the powder with intent to distribute carried mandatory time. I felt after what she'd done to me, with who she betrayed me with, part of her deserved what was coming to her. I went to her arraignment and sat in the back hoping not to be noticed. As she entered the courtroom, she saw me. I gave her a look of confusion as to how she could ever be arrested for such a crime. I knew damn well, of course, but I had to act totally oblivious. When she tried to explain to the judge that her boyfriend had been arrested for dealing only a few days before and it had to be his, the judge didn't want to hear it. She turned around and looked at me in shame with tears in her eyes, realizing I knew she'd been cheating. I shook my head in disgust as they led her away. She knew any attempt to contact with me ever again would be a fool's errand. Bond was set extremely high for both. At Will's trial, he pled guilty and asked to forego a trial in an attempt for leniency. He got none. Angie's trial took place a few weeks later and she accepted a plea. She got six years with the possibility of parole in three. But her career was over when she got out and I didn't care one bit. They'd messed with the worst person they could have ever crossed at the absolute worst time to cross me. She started her sentence two months ago. Her parents apologized to me. In all honesty, if she cheated on me at any other time in my life with almost anyone else, I doubt I would have sought out any revenge. But as they say, timing is everything and their timing could not have been worse. In some ways, I'm not proud of what I did. Will deserved to be behind bars for the rest of his days, if for nothing else but for his previous deviant crimes. Angie deserved to have any chance at a future destroyed, though all I had intended for was for her to lose her license and her job. I accomplished both for her and I hope like hell her years of incarceration are miserable and she regrets she was ever born. None of us truly ever know who we are dealing with at any given time and who not to cross. But when love turns to hate, any and every human is capable of things they would have never dreamed. All she had to do was tell me she needed a break or say she'd met someone else. Instead, she chose to feed me lies and lies of omission. Be careful who you betray. They just might be willing to go the extra mile to ruin your presence and future so badly that you have no future at all. Feel free to think of me as cruel, a monster, or think I deserve just as bad of a punishment as they received. That's your prerogative. And maybe I did, but I didn't get caught by the authorities or someone who'd endured way too much in life to just let things slide. Am I the jerk? Probably the most excruciating part of the entire aftermath was the fact that when he went to her arraignment, her plan was was all ready to tell the judge that she had a boyfriend who was dealing and that was the reason why they found that in her car. She was obviously surprised that the OP was there, but that wasn't enough to change her game plan. She still said that to the judge in front of him and then looked at him, which she interpreted as meaning she knew that she could never contact him again. There's a strange question of what ifs when it comes to the situation because had the OP not known what had happened between the two of them and she chose not to say this to the judge at that moment, then chances are he probably would have stuck with her. And she knew that, but she thought that the tiny percent chance that it would change her outcome legally would be worth forsaking anything with the OP in terms of a relationship. I understand why the OP would be so hurt and angry by all of this, but one of the parts that I don't like or support about what he did was the whole situation when they went to the bar. First of all, it's shocking that the bartender would actually go along with this because you're taking away somebody's choice. And I guess what the OP is trying to say is the reason he was able to pull this off was because the both of them had been to this bar many times and they tipped a lot so that this guy was friendly with them. In other words, the bartender knew that she was with someone safe and not just a random person. But that still doesn't sit right. And it turns out she wasn't with someone safe. She was with somebody that was trying to get her all sloshed up and put her into a dangerous situation. Does that excuse anything that she did to him? No, of course not. But that also doesn't mean that he should have done this. When it comes to the whole police Marcus Will situation, that is very eye-opening how easily the police slipped the OP all this information just because of who they thought that he was associated with. And obviously he provided them value too by creating this whole folder on Will. But the fact that he got all of Marcus's information and he was able to find him, go to his bodyguard, deliver this message, and put Will into actual mortal danger is a testament to how careless some people can be with sensitive information and how far the OP was really willing to go. So now that you know everything, which parts of this revenge do you agree with? Which parts do you disagree with and jerk or not
not a jerk and why. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the second channel where you can hear some of my personal stories, link down below in the description. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. To finish listening to all the stories in this series, use the playlist at the top of the description. And next time you live stream, use the cream of the crop music. Search for cream of the stream on Spotify or whatever music platform you use for copyright free music to use for your stream. It's free cream of the stream. Either way, thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you guys next time.